of Deception with Dave Kranzler and Rory Hall. Today is Thursday, February the 12th, 2015, and let's take a look at some of the strands that are unfolding. Looking at the Baltic Dry Index for a, a few days now, and that thing has fallen off a cliff. I mean, it really has. It's down at 30-year lows, and it is currently setting at about 570, which is right at 1986, July, July, August time frame, 1986. And according to Zero Hedge, there's only it's only been that low for eight days total during that 30-year time frame, which is pretty incredible. I mean, because really, isn't that a great indicator of what's actually happening on the ground as far as the global economy, not just the American economy, but the global economy because those ships are coming in and out of different ports and if you're not making something in one country and shipping it to another country, then everybody's suffering. Or am I not, not uh, reading that properly? Well, there's, there's two components to the Baltic dry index. I mean, there's, there's supply and demand and the enormous amount of money printing over the, you know, over the last 20 years and really it's accelerated obviously since 2008, um, has caused incredible misallocation of investment capital. And one of the things that's, that's suffered from the misallocation is, is, is shipping container shipping capacity. The index is falling because of falling demand, but it's also falling because of rising supply. And the, I, you know, what's driven it this far down is a combination of both. Okay. okay. So it, it, it can be misleading, you know, if you just Ish. present the index, you know, indicative of the demand component, because it's also indicative of the supply component. And well, and to an extent, the supply component is obviously indicative, because if you hold supply constant and demand drops, the price is going to drop. Right. Or in this case, so, you know, demand has dropped, but supply has, has increased. So it, it, it's increased nominally, not just relative to the amount of demand. And that's why what's driven it down this far and this low and it, it, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see it go even lower really yeah okay, okay. so I, I mean look at it this way the 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 incredible amount of money printing that has occurred especially since 2008 has just completely 360 degree distorted you know that the 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 economic any kind of true reading of what's going on in the economy any any kind of price seeking behavior that markets you know it's it's completely distorted every market's ability to function as as price discovery mechanisms okay, okay. and that makes sense one of the one of the ways that we're seeing this is i mean there's an enormous amount of multifamily apartment supply coming online all across the country i mean i'm seeing it all over in denver but it, it, I, I get emails from people all the time from different parts of the country saying they can't believe the number of new apartment buildings that are that are coming on stream in their cities including where i live Right there, you go. So, so, and and that's that's a that's indicative of the enormous amount of misallocation of investment capital and developers. They'll they'll keep borrowing and developing until they go broke. It's it's a it's a it's a build, sell, borrow, build more until you go broke cycle, and it happens every single time. And you wanted to look at the gold and silver markets this morning. Yesterday, a friend of mine, a colleague, called me up at, after the markets closed, and he was trying to make sense out of everything was, that's going on. He can't understand why the stock market keeps screaming higher, and it seems like they hit precious metals every single day. That's their job. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, my response to that is, well, yeah, to the extent that they can keep a lid on precious metals, they have to because because they can't promote 
their story of vibrant labor recovery, vibrant economy, everything's great and low inflation unless the precious metals are held in check. Because if all of a sudden gold and silver start screaming higher, it, it blows that story. It's the canary in the coal mine to that story. And same thing with the stock market. If the stock, you know, if 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 no, if if you're telling someone, hey, everything's getting better, and they say, well, I'm not feeling it. I don't. I can't see how it's getting better. You just say, well, look at the stock market. Right. Right. Oh yeah. I guess things must be good. I guess they'll get better for me too. So that's kind of the the dynamic there. And at some point, they will lose control over the precious metals. But I, I started thinking about it because I, I knew that gold had been moving up against the dollar since like mid-December at least and I knew that we had had a big bounce in the sector and I also kind of felt like you know we were probably going to have a pullback here and I actually I pulled up the numbers and I was actually shocked because I hadn't been paying that close attention to the num you know the return numbers in gold and silver and if you look at where they bottomed out toward the end of 2014, so, and I'm using SLV as my proxy for silver. So SLV bottomed on November 3rd at 1466, and it ran up to 1761 by January 20th. Now that's, that's just about a 21% rate of return in a little more than 10 weeks. All right. Yep. And listen to this, the Huey gold index bottomed out at 146 on November 5th, and it ran up to 207 by January 20th. That's a 41% move. That's a big move. Yeah. Now, the stock market heroin addicts would kill for a move like that. Yeah. And to be quite frank, and again, uh, you know, I, I, I call this price correction the, the unnatural price correction because it was obviously precipitated by a huge paper raid on the precious metals. And, and we've, you know, discussed that ad nauseum. I mean, it's obvious what's going on. However, in a sense, I think they almost did us a favor because if you look at that graph I sent you of SLV, Silver was starting to go parabolic. Yeah, it really was. And you don't want any, any, you know, when a market goes parabolic, it's the kiss of death for that market. You don't want your market to go parabolic. If you're a bull on a market, you do not want to see a parabolic move because that means it's the time to sell. Well, silver really looked like it was going to go parabolic. And everyone knows who's listening to this knows that the fundamental reasons for why gold and silver should be going parabolic and they know why they're not. But you, Really, you don't want it to go parabolic, and so this this price pullback, um, in my opinion, they actually did us a favor because it stopped our markets from going parabolic, and it's it's actually, even though it's an unnatural price correction because of the manipulated aspect of it, I think it's going to actually help stoke the fires for a bigger move that will come, you know later this year, maybe starting early this spring. And I'm even willing to say and go out on a limb here. And I, I, I stopped making price forecasts a long time ago because of the manipulation. I think silver is going to be the best performing asset class of 2015. That's a pretty bold statement there. Well, especially when you look at, you know, the effort that the Western central banks and governments are putting into price capping the price of gold and silver. But and, and along those lines, Dave, I wanted to ask you about the dollar. When I was talking with uh, Daniel Amaduri over at Future Money Trends a couple of days ago, he mentioned that, or actually went into great detail about the 19% move in the dollar uh, beginning back in July of 2014 through today or through now. There's been a 19% move to the upside in the dollar while gold has not moved down. It's pretty well stayed steady. From a technical perspective, what does that, can you help us to understand what that means? Well, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure. It's a great interview, by the way. Um, 
he's using a little bit longer measuring period. I mean, actually, gold really didn't go down versus the dollar. I think gold was down about 1% or 2% for all of 2014. It doesn't seem like it does. It seems like gold was down a lot more. But, but um, So gold really was kind of flat versus the dollar, and it, it obviously skyrocketed against a lot of other fiat currencies. And gold actually, starting late in twenty in late twenty fourteen, has been rising against the dollar slowly but surely. And what's interesting about the move in the dollar is it's 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 highly unnatural for currencies to make big moves like that. And to me, it tells you that there's something really wrong fundamentally behind the scenes in the system. And I think I sent you a. a longer term graph of the dollar, you'll see the last the last time the dollar really made big moves like the dollar has made in the last year are highly unnatural. Currencies aren't supposed to be that volatile. And it's 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 a it's a clear signal that that something is really wrong fundamentally behind the scenes. And in fact the last time the dollar made a huge move like that. Well, it, it did it over a series of two years starting in 2008, but it screamed higher like this in 2008. And it, and that move higher preceded the, the, the de facto collapse of our financial system. Yep. yep. And then, and then when they saved the system with QE and taxpayer money, the dollar bounced and then it went right back down. But I think in 2010, again, the dollar started moving higher, and I think that was kind of in anticipation. The Fed had started like giving us this poker face, like, will they do more QE? Will they not do more QE? So the dollar then bounced up again in anticipation that they might not do more QE, and then obviously they did more QE, and then the dollar fell again. So right. um, that was all wow. right around the beginning of uh, 2011. And then it's been right. moving, and it's been moving in a in a steady uptrend since uh, mid, early mid 2011, and then it, it dropped off a little bit back in uh, 2013, late 2013. But since the mid, probably July, it's been straight, almost straight up, way past the 88, 89 mark where it was back in 2008 and 2010. And it's, uh, this chart tops out at 94, 99, which is roughly where it is now. So that's, that's, that's a significant move higher from where it was back just before the system went belly up. Right. And to be honest, I think, I think a large part of that move in the dollar is, is, is a little bit of a technical short squeeze in the dollar because all these countries that have that had dollar denominated debt they're scrambling to to get dollars to, to pay off you know to, to to be able to repay their debt um but the other thing it's it's kind of misleading when you talk about the dollar being at 98 or 99 because it's that's the dollar index and the dollar index is measured against the biggest component is the euro the second biggest component is the yen. The third biggest component is the Canadian dollar. I mean, uh, the British pound, and then the Canadian dollar, and then the Swiss franc, and then for some reason, the, the Swedish krona. So, um, I mean, really what people refer to as the dollar is basically being measured against six other fiat currencies, and, and primarily two other fiat currencies, the euro and the yen. And obviously, the euro has been weak because of the highly publicized financial issues over there, plus the fact that, you know, everyone knew they were going to roll out QE. And then obviously, the yen has been weak because of the massive QE program that they rolled out, which they actually said they're, they're, gonna, um, they're not going to do any more QE. Well, I don't know if I believe them or not, but <laughs> it doesn't really matter. If you look at the dollar versus the Chinese yuan, the yuan actually, the dollar went down versus the yuan for most of 2014. And then China, the, the yuan was getting, ex, you know, excessively strong for, for, for the people who run China's taste. So they, they decided to um, 
ease up on the on their on their trading collar that they have on the yuan versus the dollar and 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 um they've actually been printing money themselves over there and the yuan has actually fallen a bit versus the dollar since november so it was flat versus the dollar for the i mean versus gold for the most part yeah and for most of 2014 it was down versus the yuan so i mean it's the problem with all these fiat currencies there's not you need to have something to to have an, an anchor against which you can measure everything. And that's eventually why we're going to go back to a gold standard. Which is what we need. We need, and I agree wholeheartedly, we need something that is not a an illusion to measure something of value against. And well, the, the, the value of the dollar is anchored on the judgment of some, cent, you know, some Federal Reserve bankers plus people in the White House. I mean, do you trust them? I personally no. don't. No. no. That's what I mean. It's an illusion. It's a, it's a measurement. You're measuring an illusion or you're measuring something that's supposed to have value against an illusion or a lie and instead of something that it has real value. Even a bottle of wine or a painting, I mean, has more value than the illusions and the deeds of the people that are in charge, the Federal Reserve and the people in the Treasury in Washington, D.C., these people are known uh, liars, period. And they do not have our best interest at heart. And if I've got a, if I've got something that is of value that I can measure it against, I would, I would much rather have that. I would prefer that. But at any rate, just to kind of circle back and summarize this, I, I was actually kind of shocked at the actual total rate of return numbers since gold and silver and the mining stocks had bottomed out. And so I'm looking at this latest sell-off in the sector as being kind of an unnatural price correction that ultimately is going to prove to be healthy for our market and that it's going to set up the, the base for the next move higher. Well, wow. That's what we want is, is another move higher. So, Exactly. Well, what else we got there, Dave? Is that about it? I think that's about it. I mean, there's not a lot going on. I mean, you know, supposedly there's going to be a ceasefire in Ukraine. Greece and Europe are still at odds. And Obama apparently wants omnipotent war powers to fight anyone in the world <laughs> that, that needs, needs a good lesson given to by the United States. Well, that's what we do best. We, we gave up doing business, what, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and went uh, directly into the uh, war game, and that is now our industry of choice. So that's what the United States does. That's what we manufacture is war. And uh, I guess we'll do this again unless something breaks, either tomorrow or Saturday. We'll be back at it next week. That sounds great. I'll talk to you later, Rory. All right, buddy. Have a good one. Bye.